Historic Preservationists, welcome to Season 2, Episode 3. Uh, this episode, we're going to combine three things. The love of clocks, Benjamin Franklin, and first in flight. History and science combination. Uh, so what this is leading to, this is leading to the first time that man has ever taken off from the surface of the Earth. And it involves Benjamin Franklin in Paris when he's the official, unofficial, ambassador to the United States to win armaments and monetary awards so that we could help defeat the British. And in doing so, Franklin is a hobnobber. He, he meets all the great scientists, and it's, it's his passion. It's his hobby, so to speak. So he befriends um, a pair of brothers named the Montgolfier brothers. The Montgolfier brothers are Joseph and Etienne, and they are involved in their family has been for 500 years in the paper making industry in France, making some of the best paper for all the, the best, uh, or the monarchs in the world, and the uh, laid papers, classic laid papers, everything by hand that's, that involves with, you know, mashing rags up and, and then uh, making, making the, the, some of the great papers that we've ever seen in the history of the world. But this still continues. But Franklin befriends them, and Etienne is an inventor, and Joseph is an engineer. And Franklin enjoyed the, the art of paper making and would uh, frequently have uh, dinner over at Etienne's house. And uh, uh, they remarked one night, uh, at least Joseph did, about uh, his wife was doing laundry and during the process of dinner in front of a wide hearth fireplace. And they had their shirts, these blossom shirts, these huge shirts with the huge, uh, you know, the huge sleeves and arms. And, and it was sitting on a, a hangers in front of the fireplace, and the whole shirt was moving and shifting in front of the fireplace with the hot air going in it. And uh, Joseph, the, uh, the engineer, got very inspired. And he said, uh, you know, uh, I, I wonder if this could fly. And, and they did a lot of testing with the shirt in the fireplace. They, they, they undid the shirt from the hanger, and the shirt went up just a tad bit, and it came back down. They tied off the top and did experimentation like that. So this led to brainstorming between the three, Franklin and the two brothers. So hence, in around 17, uh, 1782, uh, what they did was they started doing experiments um, using making small globes out of paper because they're in the paper making industry and lighting a small fire underneath. And they let the globes go and the globes would go up in the air. So that inspired them. So let's uh, maybe possibly man could actually take off. So that what this is moving toward is first in flight, first in flight, 18th century. This is not the Wright brothers' first in flight, and I think some uh, some of us are led to believe that through uh, elementary school, uh, not directly, but it kind of that's that's what I was led to believe. So first in flight here is the first time man has taken off from the surface of the earth. So what occurred was the brothers kept uh, experimenting. They eventually built a large balloon out of paper 35 feet in diameter. Imagine 35 feet in diameter, and with the bottom of the balloon coming down, it was some 60, 65 feet. And uh, they sent the balloon up and, uh, you know, it was unmanned, it had a basket, and what they did was they put straw and wool in the bottom of it, and the balloon actually caught fire. So, you know, really, I mean, it's something you would imagine at that point. But the balloon caught fire while it was up, and it landed in a nearby village. So just imagine, in 1782, a balloon coming out of, something coming out of the sky and landing in a village in rural France. Um, you had all the Frenchmen, they were beating the balloon with sticks and, and trying to kill what they would have thought. They had no idea what this thing was. So back to the, uh, back to the drawing board. So the Montgolfier brothers, assisted by Benjamin Franklin while he's there in his free time, um, so they came up with a, a balloon which would have a cloth lined with cotton canvas on both sides and paper in between. And they actually called on uh, uh, a man called uh, Revelé, and it would actually become the cosmetics company, Revlon. So Revlon, Revelé became Revlon 200 and some years later, and you know, we have cosmetics for women. But Revelé, or Revlon, was a wallpaper manufacturer. And um, they were making wallpaper uh, for the king and for the affluent people in France at the time. So they brought him on to actually decorate this balloon. So we're going to take a quick look at the balloon. Um, and this is a, a, 
actually a drawing by Benjamin Franklin. Okay? In all the decoration, the king, the sun king, Louis XVI we're talking here, his insignia and the crossed double L's, reverse double L's, and all of this decoration was done by Revlon, and, uh, or his company, which was called Revlon in the time. So the wallpaper manufacturer came over to decorate the Montgolfier's balloon and uh, the rendition by Mr. Franklin. So the only way we know this had occurred is uh, we found out only about 30 years ago that Benjamin Franklin was the only one that we found notes that day. So he was able to uh, sit on a balcony of one of the Montgolfier brothers. They had an apartment in Paris around the 11th arrondissement. And how I tie into this very interesting, how I dovetail into this, is I was an apprentice to a gilding, uh, one of the top gilders in Paris for two years, back in the early 2000s. I would go through this great courtyard door uh, with, with the doors 18 inches thick of wood, uh, 14 feet high, that the king's carriage could come through and see what the artisans were working on. I would have my gilding apprenticeship through there five nights a week. There was a plaque that I would pass every day, and it said on this point above this plaque is where Benjamin Franklin sat and watched first in flight by the Montgolfier brothers. And uh, that just amazed me and just it took my mind in many directions that Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, actually stood here, sat up here on the balcony. So, uh, obviously when this word got of this failed attempt of the paper balloon by the Montgolfier brothers, and uh, in addition to Louis the Sixteenth did not want a manned affair, a manned flight, a manned liftoff, because he didn't want to be blamed that if two or one or three individuals were killed, if the basket, if the flight didn't work, so he said, okay, we want to put animals. But this caused kind of a hysteria. And you had a lot of inventor types in the age of enlightenment, the 18th century. And remember, man was contemplating going up in balloons since the 15th century. Um, so we had another inventor named Rosier. He was a physician in Paris, one of the lead physicians of, uh, he was a lead surgeon. So he was an inventor. So he sold a failed attempt of the Montgolfier brothers. He had a lot of money. He was well healed. And he had some people build a balloon for him. Unfortunately, he was the next to go up. So the Montgolfier brothers did not get the first in flight, first man. But prior to that, their next flight, because Louis said that no human beings could go in the balloon, he said, but you could put animals in the balloon. So they put a sheep, a duck, and a cock in the balloon. And they sent them up. And they went up about 900 feet and went three miles. And they had a basket down below. And they, they set a brazier fire going on with straw and with wool. And it was tethered, and this thing was just pulling at the tethers. And they released the tethers, and the animals went up. And it went up 900 feet and went three miles to the next village and landed in the woods. And people were running and following it. When they, they landed, they found that the, the animals were still alive. And uh, they pulled the animals out. And it was a national day of the, the hero. For the animals were the heroes. So from that point on, the history of aeronautics changed. The history of man leaving Earth changed. Every airplane, every other balloon that's ever gone up was because of the Montgolfier brothers first in flight. And the reason we know this about this flight and the next succeeding flights for are Rosier and the Montgolfier brothers was because of the Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Franklin sitting on the balcony, he was writing down, he wrote down what the people were wearing, how many people were there to watch, their reaction as it lifted off, the smoke, the, the atmosphere, everything about that day. He drew the balloon, as I just showed you in the book. And that information somehow found its way to the Greenwich Maritime Museum in, in England. And it was unearthed about 20 years ago. Now it's there under lock and key and proper t t conditions uh, for anyone to see if you're interested. And But it tells exactly what happened in first and with the Montgolfier brothers. So we'll finish the story up. So there was a physician. He was the next. He had his balloon ready in line right up to the animal balloon for the Montgolfier brothers. He didn't ask the king's permission. He, he went up on the balloon himself. He went up again about uh, eight, 900 feet, and he, he went a couple miles, and he landed, and he was fine. So Rosier, Monsieur Rosier was the first man to go up, a physician in, French, uh, in France, to uh, be the first man to leave the earth. In a flying machine or a sailing machine. 
So literally about a month later, the Montgolfier's bloom that I just showed you. It had all that uh, ornamentation by Monsieur Revelon, all the, the king's gold. It, was, it, it had 20 pounds of gold, gold powder, gold dust, decorated that balloon. And the Montgolfier brothers finally went up on their own balloon. And Franklin also observed that, and he wrote about that, and it's in the ledgers in the uh, National Maritime Museum in England. And so how does this tie into me? Other than thinking this is very interesting, very important stuff for everyone to know out there. So I've been a Franklin aficionado for many years. Uh, I've written, or have written many books about him. Um, I'm a great believer in Benjamin Franklin, what he did here with the revolution in America and in as far as science goes. So uh, I was in Paris. I went back to Paris to do a quick apprenticeship in uh, 2007. And uh, I heard that this is, was Franklin's 300th birthday. I heard there was the four, four museums in Paris, and two of those museums were the Art de Métier and the, the uh, Musée Carnavalet. They were the two major museums, but four museums, two of the smaller ones, got together. And they put together a walking tour, um, a walking tour, everything Franklin. So they put 25% of each of the four museums' floor space about the doctor, Benjamin Franklin, his 300th birthday. And the interesting thing was, here in America, the Benjamin uh, the Franklin Institute and other uh, things associated with Franklin had nothing to do with this. No great association with, with celebrations of Franklin's 300. So how sad is that for us to be in America? But yet the French did it up in a big way. So I started at the Arts and Metier and had some of Franklin's uh, measuring instruments of when he was coming back from France of a seven year stay, measuring the Gulf Stream. And when you think about Franklin, his measurements of the Gulf Stream um, are what planes follow today coming in Europe back to the States. So I worked my way in this, this tour. The tour took actually two full days. It was well planned out. And uh, I pulled into the uh, Musée de Carnavalet and I'm talking to a curator, and uh, a curator that I met many years ago while I was this student at the Louvre in Paris. And uh, she said, I have something particularly may interest you. I have some engravings, some metal plates. They were about 9, 10, 12 inches, uh, 9 by 12, something like that. And they were engraved metal plates that they would actually, that pamphleteers would use. So they would, they would coat them with an ink, and they would stamp them onto paper, and they would hand out or sell these pages. Oh, look what Franklin did, or look what the Montgolfier brothers did. So they had this wonderful plate, and I'm looking at, and I can't believe my eyes, I'm looking at a plate of Benjamin Franklin with a huge clock under his arm. And now I've seen 10,000 tall case clocks because I'm a horologist. I've done this for the last 30 years. And the clock case, the tall case, was very specific. It was huge. Franklin could hardly get his arm and carry it. So it was proportioned to his body. And I'm looking, I'm looking, getting very stimulated and saying, you know what, I've seen this clock before. And I'm a clock collector. I have 150 tall case clocks. So. The first time I was very eager to get out of Paris and get back to my studio. Um, I was in there for another five days, but when I got back, I rushed to the clock collection, and some of my collection had been, remained untouched. Some of it needs to be restored. So keep in mind, some of the clocks are five deep against the wall. And here I found the back against the wall clock I purchased, oh, about 12 years prior. I forgot all about it. To me, it appeared very heavy and big at the time. But something struck me about the clock that Franklin was carrying. In the center of the clock, just below the mid door, in an oval, a horizontal oval, was a beautifully carved M. It wasn't a carved in size M, carved in relief into the wood. It was an, an embossed part of the, the, the fabric of that clock case that was relieved with the M standing proud, almost like little conical seashells about a half inch long the half-inch seashells actually made this huge M. And I've seen the M of the Montgolfier brothers on their balloons, on their letterhead, and dealing with Benjamin Franklin in the past. So at last, conferring with the museum coordinator after I got back from Paris, sending her many photographs, actually doing imprints of cast of the M on the front of the clock, they confirmed that Franklin, in fact, she told me the story when I was there, had two clocks made in commemoration of first in flight for the Montgolfier brothers. And this was done in the 11th arrondissement. A cabinet maker made these clock cases, and I actually have one. 
So this is the revelation here. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, I've had much communication in the last 15 years with the, uh, with the MUSE. Um, uh, prior to discovering this, and then since then, um, so we've, made, we've made the direct correlation that this is one of the cases. They do not know where the other case is. Um, so they have a great desire to have this case in the end, and it will be presented to them. So uh, in this episode, this is a great lead up, uh, a tie up, we're going to be looking at the clock case, after you've all had the story now, the clock case of Benjamin Franklin, uh, one of them who gave what she gave to the McGoffey brothers for recognition of first in flight. So um, glad you're joining us. And uh, we're gonna start out by taking a look at the clock mechanism. So Franklin chose a very, one of the key clock makers of the period in Paris to make a three train clock mechanism for his, uh, his special clock cases for his friends. So let's get started. Well, chronologically speaking, let's start looking at this gift that Franklin bequested to the, uh, to the Montgolfier brothers for first in flight. Two clocks, the clock mechanism and the clock cases were identical. And again, this is one of them here. So very privileged just to have this in my horological studio, uh, just undergone a service. So let's let's take a look at the front or the face of this clock, the dial, as some call it. Um, this is out of enamel, so we'll talk about the dial first. Uh, typically, uh, French, some Dutch clocks are out of enamel. Typically, they're either painted or brass. Otherwise, uh, enamel is actually taking a piece of copper. So there's a there's a, a convex piece of copper here, and then a powdered glass in white is put over and covered, put into an oven. And we're talking about in the early 1770. So you get a nice gloss, a nice smooth surface with enamel, which is, again, this, in this case, it's white glass over the copper convex uh, dome, so to speak. And what, what happens here is, in enameling, which was really invented uh, or perfected in Switzerland, then they come over with glass powder and they actually lay in all the numerals. They lay the numerals in and all these digit lines and the line of the circle here and the name of the baker and the location it was made. It's pretty amazing. And laying it with a wet brush and almost painting with glass powder. And you paint the powder in and you paint it perfect with the all freehand done in 1770 to produce this dial. Then it goes back into the kiln, and the black melts into the white. So the black has a much lower melting point, almost 30%, than the white. It melts in, but it doesn't, it doesn't blend and flow. It maintains the lines that it was laid down in. Now take note of that. That's just one bell strike. That's an English movement we're talking about. The Montgolfier brothers' gift here is a French. This is a French mechanism. That was just a British mechanism from 1830. One bell at the high hour. Boom, boom, boom. It was 10, 10 o'clock. Okay? So that's good. So it gives us an idea. Here, we're operating on four bells. We'll get to that in a minute. But we're, we're going through the dial now. So we talked about the dial. Um, this brass color is the dial surround. It's been highly cleaned. Uh, this is called repose. Repose is taking a piece of very, very thin brass, and what would happen is someone would carve a wooden form. They carve this form, and this is a form of this couple in love holding their hands, and, and various spandrel forms and, and foliage forms at the bottom. So it was carved in a big wooden block, and then someone would take this piece of flat brass and gently pound in every nook and cranny and they would mimic the reverse of that carved uh, wood block and that's called repose and that's how this was achieved. It's very thin, it's very fragile and a lot of these don't survive over you know several hundred years but this is a beautiful shape, it's clean and it actually has mercury gilding which is a very thin coat of gold and mercury put on the mercury has been burned off and you're left with about a 23 karat gold surface, so very beautiful. So that's the surround, or maybe we'll call it the frame of, of the dial, the round dial. Um, we have hands, they're hand cut out, hand filed. 
out of brass, typically in the French fashion. English did it with hard, cold steel. So the French are doing something much easier to cut out. Um, so this, uh, this clock was made by the uh, Paget, Paget Frere, or the Paget Brothers in Paris. Very notable, very high end. We're in the top five of the uh, horological builders in the uh, third to fourth quarter of the 18th century in Paris. And uh, so they were represented in Paris. And Franklin went to them as an initial uh, star. Talking about in the early 1770s. So you get a nice gloss, a nice smooth surface with enamel, which is, again, this, in this case, it's white glass over the copper convex uh, dome, so to speak. And what, what happens here is in enameling, which was really invented uh, or perfected in Switzerland, then they come over with glass powder and they actually lay in all the numerals. They lay the numerals in and all these digit lines and the line of the center here. And the name of the maker and the location it was made. It's pretty amazing. And laying it with a wet brush and almost painting with glass powder. And you paint the powder in and you paint it perfect with a, all freehand done in 1770 to produce this dial. Then it goes back into the kiln and the black melts into the white. So the black has a much lower melting point, almost 30%, than the white. It melts in, but it doesn't, it doesn't blend and flow. It maintains the lines that it was laid down in. Now take note of that. That's just one bell strike. That's an English movement. We're talking about the Montgolfier brothers' gift here. It's a French. This is a French mechanism. That was just a British mechanism from 1830. One bell at the high hour, boom, boom, boom. It was 10, 10 o'clock, okay? So that's good. So it gives us an idea. Here, we're operating on four bells. We'll get to that in a minute. But we're, we're going through the dial now. So we talked about the dial. Um, this brass color is the dial surround. It's been highly cleaned. Uh, this is called repose. Repose is taking a piece of very, very thin brass, and what would happen is someone would carve a wooden form. They carve this form, and this is a form of this couple with gloves holding their hands, and, and various spandrel forms, and, and foliage forms at the bottom. So it was carved in a big wooden block, and then someone would take this piece of flat brass and gently pound in every nook and cranny, and they would mimic the reverse of that carved uh, wood block, and that's called repose, and that's how this was achieved. It's very thin, it's very fragile, and a lot of these don't survive over you know, several hundred years. But this is a beautiful shape, it's clean, and it actually has mercury gilding, which is a very thin coat of gold and mercury put on, and mercury has been burned off, and you're left with about a 23 karat gold surface, so very beautiful. So that's the surround, or maybe we'll call it the frame of, of the dial, the round dial. Um, we have hands that are hand cut out, hand filed, out of brass, typically in the French fashion. English did it with hard, cold steel. So the French are doing something much easier to cut out. Um, so this uh, this clock was made by the uh, Paget, Paget Frere, or the Paget Brothers in Paris. Very notable, very high end, with the top five of the uh, horological builders in the uh, third to fourth quarter of the 18th century in Paris. And uh, so they were represented in Paris. And Franklin went to them as an initial uh, startup to find a movement. Um, first, he, wanted, he went to the brothers and he said he wanted something so absolutely over the edge, abnormal, for such a great feat that these individuals have created. You just heard the English bell strike. The English bell strikes one time. This is going to strike in just a minute. One time, it's 20 o'clock, one hit. So Franklin had the option. He says, how creative can you be? And this clock is called a, a comptoir, C-O-M-T-O-I-S-E, or a Morbier. The same thing refers to this mechanism here. Um, and typically, they only go off at one bell at the high hour. But Franklin wanted something so spectacular. So he went to, to the... Paget brothers, and he said, what can you do? He said, we can give you two bells, or 
I don't know, three bells is pushing it. Franklin said, let's make something so over the top. We want four bells, a clock you've never made. Some of the most important horologists in, in Paris of the day. So the Bechet brothers had a, a boutique in Paris, and they did some repairs there. But their base was Amore du Jura. So it was the town of Jura, or the, 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 the town of, uh, uh, which is a small village right between the French and Italian borders, right literally on the border. Part of the town is on one side, part is on the other. And that's where these, these clocks, these Morbier clocks, were created. And they went down to the artisans there, and these early artisans were actually, um, they were locksmiths. Um, and that's how the clock making started in this region of France. And we'll get a closer look at the side. This is this case is of hard tube steel construction with all the wheels going in between. But nevertheless, that's how. So this movement with four bells never been done before on the Morbier Comtois type clock at Benjamin Frank's Franklin's request for the Montgolfier brothers for the feet of first in flight. So it took about a year and a half for them to actually build this magnificent piece of horology. So they did two of them, one for each of the brothers. And typically, if anyone out there is aware of, when you have a, quote, three-train movement, usually the winding arbors are up higher, much higher, on, in the middle of the dial. They're hanging very low, and this is an extraordinary large and high um, French mechanism. Usually they're all about this high totally. So to get all that additional gears, uh, wheel work in there, and the bells on top, it took a lot more of the case per cage, as they would call this movement, in the day. So we're about ready to strike now, and it's it's going to, this is your quarter hour strike here, this is where you wind it, this is your time strike, your time, uh, time winding arbor, and this is your high hour. So it's going to strike, and it's going to tell you that it's, sequences is very unique so you're having three bells almost a musical note and that's why this would be considered a Morbier Comtois uh, clock and so up here it gave you one two three bells and then it went into the high strike of 12 hour 12 so every every quarter it hits 12 high strikes of the hour with a large bell here the other ones are leading up to a crescendo at first it gives you the three notes it gives you six notes and it gives you nine notes, and then 12 notes, and then the high hour. That's how this works. We're going to hear the, the three uh, musical notes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Nine notes, and then the 12 high hour strike. Day clocks. They call it an eight day clock, means that the clock really runs for seven, but generally speaking, they had, would have enough cord for, uh, for, for eight days, just in case you know you would forget to wind it that, that seventh day. Some people did. But these clocks were so important in the day that everybody relied on time, so it was very important to that everybody wind their clock. And you can wind this clock any time in the middle of the eight days. Uh, you can see here we have. Uh, lead weights and a, and a, a cast iron weight. Never are these weights original. Weights are always lost and moved around. 
and that's just how it is. And this is our pendulum. And maybe we can see around, uh, we have a pendulum floating here. It's a steel rod with a brass bob on the end, a brass knob here. That's typical in the English fashion. In the French fashion, which is interesting, is uh, it's almost like a sinker, but it's, it's, a, it's only a four ounce weight on the pendulum bob. So these were, uh, these could be you know, carried by itinerant clockmakers to the pretensive client, uh, just folding them up and putting it in their satchel on one side, and the weights on one side, and the mechanism on the other. These huge satchels they would carry on horseback. So this was all for ease of delivery. If you had a solid steel rod, the rod could be easily bent. Um, so you have a lot of adjustment on these guys here. I, I need to get this down. There we go. Okay. So you you un, you take it out of the accordion type of motion, and it has a little brass bob. You pull it back. You set the pendulum in motion, and she's off and running. Typically, in an English clock, which I deal with most, the pendulum is attached to the back. And as we can see, either side, this is attached to the back, right here. It's hanging by a suspension, suspension spring. This is attached to the front, hanging up from a suspension, suspension spring right in the front. So just a little bit of tech, different technology. That means the mechanism has to be pushed back into the movement a little bit more. So, uh, and uh, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look on the side and take a look at the mechanism, what's happening with the gears while this is going through its strike sequence. So taking a look at the side of our, our Morbier mechanism here, again, I was explaining earlier that this is called a cage mechanism early on made by blacksmiths, going back almost to the 12th century. They were making this type of mechanism for tower clocks, for clocks, street clocks, cathedral clocks. And then somewhere around the early 1700s, they started adapting smaller and smaller for clocks, for businesses, for royalty, the aristocracy and the home. And they formed this out of a cast cage, a cast top plate, bottom plate, and four legs for a cage. Everything else in here is machined out of steel. The steel is cast, and then it's machined down, it's hardened. Um, our gears are made in brass. Our rope or cord is made of a cotton type cloth. Um, in addition, this is called a governor. So this is a, looks like a fan, and it feels like a fan, and it's actually pierced. So what it does, it controls the rate of strike. So if we didn't have this fan being slowed down by the air, the clock would be very rapid. But this slows it down to the cadence of strike that we're after. And you'll see that fan go into operation when we start setting the clock into a, uh, a shine motion. This is a counterweight. So there's a fan on either side. This fan controls the three notes here, and the fan on the other side controls the high straight and cadence. Sometimes there's repairs needed on these fans. They sort of break after years of usage. It's one of the weak links. Um, and we just talked about the cord. Um, and let's just take a look at winding. So I have a typical key, uh, a winding key for a clock. I'm going to put it on the arbor. And you're going to start to look and see I'm going to be winding the rope up on the spool, and this is a clicked on or a stop, and there's a ratchet. Every movement gets locked in, so there's no return. Click, 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 hence the name clicked on. So I'm winding up the rope to get more power. So the, the essence of power that makes this ancient machine run is gravity. Gravity pulling down on these weights. Now let's, uh, let's just take a look again at the movement as we go into our half hour. So again, I think at the beginning it sounds like a regular machine, but 
this machine can go almost 70, 80 years with almost no service many times. So, but again, one of the most magnificent clock mechanisms of the Morbier style. Remember the French made other clocks, they made round clock mechanisms, highly sophisticated with jeweled movements. But this was a very country type, country type mechanism made. And, and I think it was something that would, could be quickly made, quickly adapted to the four bell system that was meant to impress, or meant to impress um, Franklin's friends and, and his fellow scientists for this uh, world-changing accomplishment. So uh, I think this was a much easier mechanism to change than a really small mechanism, a tight mechanism, encased in, in small plates. So, uh, so anyway, so it's an honor to have this in my workshop. Uh, it's being serviced right now. And uh, we're going to move on, and we're going to take a look and see the finer aspects of this wonderful clock case. This is Alistair. So we're back to get from Franklin for the Montgolfier brothers. Again, it was a pair that we just looked at the mechanism in the, in the clock shop. Now we're taking a look at the case to an examination of the case. The case is in French walnut. Uh, you know, sometimes from a distance someone would say, well, that's a cherry case. But remember, cherry is very tight grain. And if we look very close, we can see all this black grain and this mottledness here, and that's a walnut. First-generation walnut in France, and uh, this is what walnut looks like when it tends to mellow out, in a caramel, taffy-type tone. A little bit different from, um, you know, there weren't a lot of walnut trees in England. There were a few, but a little bit different because a lot of the French walnut went over to England to make furniture in the 18th century. And uh, when they finally got to the war, the uh, that, that you know one of their wars, the French said, you know what? We're not going to sell you any more lumber, and they, they're going to shut down a vital part of the British industry, the furniture making and the woodworking for all their manor houses and castles. So walnut was cut off, and at the same time in that early 18th century, what had happened is there was three or four winters, some of the coldest winters in the last five to six hundred years, and it actually helped destroy the whole walnut population. So, so we have old walnut here. We have uh, you know this beautiful, this magnificent uh, artifact here. Franklin as a gift, uh, you know, has some holes in it, and these are uh, these are like uh, uh, weevil type holes or worm holes, wood worm holes, and uh, so they, it's it's a really popular type of uh, cuisine for uh, you know more wood worms with better palates. Is this old walnut, believe it or not? But when I first saw this, as I was speaking uh, in the main part of the conservation room, uh, I was in the Musée de Carnivalet. And I saw a plaque, an engraved metal plaque, with Franklin, with his his, uh, his coonskin cap on, and a huge clock under his arm, engraving it, eight and a half by eleven. And what struck me was the crazy nature of this, the curvature of this clock. I've I've been around ten thousand tall case clocks, nothing like this. Number one, the clock is in one piece. It's a monster. I mean, for one man, how did you move it? Typically, remember, these clocks could be strapped to the back of horses or on the side of horses for a delivery purpose. And maybe a satchel on the rider with the move mechanism and, and the weights would have been strapped over the horse's back, one on either side. But this clock is too big, would have had to been delivered by a wagon, probably an unsprung wagon at the time, unfortunately. Um, so it was one piece. Um, and as you can see up at the top, I hope we can see with the camera, we can see that it's, it's, it's all hand created with a hand plane, that upper cove molding. So it's all one piece in the front. So a lot of craftsmanship there. So we have, uh, we're gonna start at the top here. So we have a uh, you know, glass door, we have a mid door. But the glass door, you can see the, pe the, uh, the pegs. These are walnut pegs. We have side lights and the side lights are to see the mechanism. Again, this is a magnificent mechanism as we saw in the clock shop. And these side lights lift up like such out so you know for easy uh, ease of portability and uh, this is an old type putty that's been put in here so uh, you know they're very specific to each side but the great thing is you know this clock you just assemble the doors off uh, just to make sure nothing gets broken when you're moving it around because a lot of these clocks and, and types of artifacts moved around from matter house to matter house whoever had them because uh, you know maybe they were staying in in tour france for you know for one season or for the spring and they want to move back to paris in the summer so they would take all the doors out off wrap it up and then put the case 
in a wagon. So that's kind of standard protocol. But what makes this interesting again is, is it's almost like a, a, a woman in a great gown in the 18th century. She has this huge gown with a superstructure underneath, and it almost seems like what it is here, and then her waist gets pinched in a bit. But instead of a typical tall case clock from England, where the hood will stretch out, and they're called pinch waist, this goes straight up. Um, and it has fluted. So the, as it comes down the corner here, we're, we have flutes, hand-carved flutes. And we have some wheat sheaths here, and, and, and a floral motif uh, flanking on either side. And we have a sunflower, and it's kind of reminiscent of, of Louis, the, the sun king. But if you look at this, you see the delicacy of carving here, the undercutting, the cutting inside of the center of the fistula. It is absolutely a masterpiece, this piece here. And you're even seeing some layout lines uh, around the circumference when they're first laying this flower out. So this was carved into a piece of stock. This was not carved and applied. So a thicker piece of stock, and they leveled it both sides and carved the flower down so that it projected out. And then they cut the stock flutes in. So just, just a wonderful piece. And the back on the inside is, uh, uh, we'll get to the harbor in a minute, but the back is typical French oak. So um, just a, a turn latch here, and you can see very early uh, metalwork, but it's beautiful metalwork. Almost a, it almost feels English in a way, almost a Tudor, uh, a Tudor type motif. And the handle has been well thought out. It's tapered, and it's almost submarining on both ends of that handle. Just a lot of thought. It's a lot of great feel in the handle, the turn. And as we come down, but let's go back up here. You know, these are typical of the period, early 18th century to the end of the 18th century, full length of barrels and hinges. And um, what, what holds these are round clasps with a threaded rod that goes into the case and is bolted, so these two. But again, this has you know the cap capability of unfolding from in here and removing the window so it doesn't get broken in transport. Again, a vital key. So we don't need to be replacing things. Get down to the mid door now. Stop flutes continue down. We have sheaves of wheat here, and uh, actually some descending bellflowers or upsetting bellflowers. That is, what makes this and what identifies this to the, to the powers of the be, the, the uh, conservator, the, uh, uh, at the Musée de Carnavalet, is this M. This M is carried through all of the Montgolfier's paper for 500 years. Boxes that would come in, some monograms on the top of pages and invoices. This end, Franklin has this copy of one of their pages of invoices to the sculptor, and he sculpted this. Again, the same great man carved this flower and carved this end. All the beautiful stippling in the oval. But this has been heavily scrutinized by the Musée de Carnaval in Paris to identify this as that clock that I saw in that engraving, a happenstance. Absolutely amazing stuff. But if we go back to the door, typical panel doors are rectangular, they're square. This is going all sorts. This is just a typical French motif here. So the cope and, and the style of rails reflect that, but just, just a very intricate piece to build. It's not your typical basic grace panel door. But when we come over on the sides, we have flat panels. So the panels are totally flat, they're inset. These are raised of the raised variety. Um, and on, on both sides, both side panels, a little bit of crotch is used to give a little bit of, uh, make a little bit of interest there. Um, and when I run my hand over this, I can feel the hand plane marks. They're so subtle. I mean, the French have scraped this down to such a degree where it's, it almost feels dead flat. But you can feel that there are some hand plane marks in this, uh, this wonderful clock case. So let's move down to the base. The base is so much higher than normal. Remember, a typical clock base is probably here about 20 inches. And this guy is way up here, you know, forging, burgeoning on about 40 inches at the top. Um, and just, you know, so beautiful. this is all hand carved. This, this is not carved by a saw, you couldn't do it. So they, they took this and they dished this piece out and they carved the flutes and the bellflowers and the she wheat sheets. And look at this panel, one piece, one panel raised. Um, again, to mimic the typical French design of that here as is the panel above. And in a different manner, typically uh, bottom moldings are squared off of pointers. This is hand carved to a corner and rounding around. So this would have been a masterpiece. And this this piece we uh, we trace back to the 
um, the 11th of August fall. Um, so it's, and, and coincidentally enough, it's probably just around two blocks down from the infamous Aco Bowl where I studied the, you know, the trades of, uh, of furniture conservation and restoration. So this was originally made there. That courtyard still stands there. When I was had my stay in Paris, I would go through, uh, again, I think I mentioned it on the, uh, on the dissertation, I'd go through a doorway, an arched doorway, about 14 foot high. The door was actually 14 to 18 inches thick in places of solid oak to keep marauders out. And they would, they would open it, let the king in, and it had to be high enough and arched to let the king's carriage come through. He'd come through once a week to check out all the artisans, this Tudor style courtyard. And it goes back probably to the 12th century, this particular courtyard. And that's where this clock case was made. And I was actually taking a gilding, I was taking a gilding apprenticeship there for two years. And, and the crazy thing is I had no idea of any of this information when I was doing that. And when I'd walk in there at 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night for my, my two-hour gilding and apprenticeship every night of the week, there was a plaque there and it was hidden by some lumber and some trash that was against this building. And it said that on this balcony, in the last couple of days in Paris, after five years, I finally saw it. On the balcony above is where Benjamin Franklin sat, and it's where one of the Montgolfier brothers had their apartment just above this arched doorway, and they let him sit there to view first in flight. So all this came back and it all ties in nicely. So a little bit of a warp on the door here, um, but you know I don't know what this is, but again I can feel hand planing. Look at these lovely hand wrought nails. These are all original nails going back to you know the mid 18th century. You see the French oak on the inside, full length boards, no frills here, and this guy weighs a ton. Um, so anyway, so I can't wait to get the mechanism back in because it's going to undergo a restoration from what we saw last time. Um, so we're ready to get it going. And, and again, more hand wrought nails and hand wrought locks and discussions and the like. So, uh, so again, uh, just a sense of, uh, of just so much pride to have this guy, this, this piece of art here. Um, and it's such a rarity in the world. And, uh, when everyone hears the story, they're quite amazed. So, so that's going to wrap up our, our first in flight. Uh, the Montgolfier brothers slash ben, the doctor, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, we're doing it all on the banks of the Alloway Creek, which uh, is where Wisterglass started, tying into one of our other episodes in season one. And going back, um, Franklin was actually at the spot with Wister on occasions for his glass harmonica. So we keep coming around in the circle. Franklin, Glass, Worcester, early American history. It's all here in Salem County. So thanks everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.